If you're right-handed, you do just the opposite. And the reason that you do that, it just makes it easier for you to tighten. So I've got this pretty loose, so it's really easy for me to get it in there. I see some 4-H'ers are just working so hard to get it in there because they've tightened it up before they've laced it. So there are the two acceptable ways to tie your knot. One if you're left-handed, one if you're right-handed. Again, at this point, the cinch is not done up tight. It's just tight enough so it won't fall off if he moves. You will then bridle your horse and you'll move him a few steps and gradually tighten it up as you go. Notice the distance between the D-ring on the cinch and the D-ring on the saddle. That's about as much distance as you want. If your D-ring on your saddle is way up here, then adjust it on the other side. Or if it's up there anyway, then obviously the cinch is too long for the particular horse you are now riding and you'll need to get a shorter one. Likewise, if your cinch is way down here and you've got a huge space from here up to here, then your cinch is too short and you'll need to get a longer one. So once we're ready to bridle the horse, the first step is get the bridle ready. So when you do go to put it on the horse's head, it's going to be in a position that's going to be readily usable to you. So I'm gonna put it on my arm here. Notice the brow band is facing my elbow because I'm gonna put it on his head like this, not like this. So have the brow band facing your elbow. Nothing up above the elbow, nothing wrapped around your arm. So everything bridle-wise is on your left arm. Your right hand is going to be used to help take the halter off. Again, you don't want to put the halter way back on the neck because the horse has the advantage if you put it way back here. Up here, he is more sensitive, so you as the handler have the advantage. So, halter-wise, my shank is not wrapped around my arm, but it's over my arm, anywhere between the elbow and the wrist. If you have a short shank, just put it over once. If you have a long shank, double it and place it over, but never wrap that shank around your wrist or arm. Now, in the bridling stage, first stage is, let's get the horse's head captured. So step one, I just put the bridle around his chin like that. The reason I do that is if he chooses to take his head away from me, I can use this to pull it back towards me. Step two, right hand holds the crown piece. Step three, my thumb is going to go into the corner of his mouth even if this horse automatically opens his mouth. I think it's a good habit for all 4-H'ers to get into because we never want to hear the bit hitting the horse's teeth. If we do that, that's the handler that has made that mistake. So I'm going to lower this and grasp the bit. So I'll just take it off him again so you can see how it should be held. So this is how it needs to be held when you get to the stage where you're going to put the bit in his mouth. Your baby finger keeps the chin strap back and out of the way. Your other fingers help support the bit and your thumb pushes the bit so it doesn't fold up tight. So that's how we want it to be. So again, under his chin, I can bring his head a little bit towards me if I think he's going to pull away. Then if he swings his head, it's likely going to go away from me, not towards me. My thumb is going to go in the corner of his mouth. I'm not in a big hurry for him to open his mouth. Now I'm just going to tickle his gums with my thumb. When he opens his mouth, it's the top hand that lifts the bit up. If you were listening carefully, you should have noticed that we did not bang the bit on his teeth. Now, the other thing we have to be careful of is his ears. If we manhandle and scrunch his ears all up, pretty soon his head's gonna be so high that we can't get it on. So notice I just take his ear at the base and I'm just going to move it very slightly forward and put the brow band and the crown piece around his ear. Now do the same thing with the other one. And usually it looks better if we bring the forelock out, so now's a good time to do that. Reach under like this and make sure that brow band is up here in this hollow, not down here over his eye. So make sure it's even, you can kind of feel that. If this is sticking up, you can pull it down on side A or side B. Make sure when you check your bridle 
that the throat latch has the buckle side going up. And the reason that you want that to happen is so when you do do it up, that the tip or the tail or the loose end is pointed down. And then it's not flapping around the horse's eyes and being an irritant to him. So this is how we put on a snaffle bridle or any kind of a bridle, all right? In this throat latch here, I can get about four fingers between his cheek, so he can certainly flex and bend, and that's not going to be too tight on him, nor is it going to be too loose. The bit is up, so it's just touching the corner of his mouth where his top lip becomes his bottom lip, and we do have a chin strap on a snaffle. It does not have any purpose as a pressure point on a snaffle. The purpose of it is, if I use this open rein and he's running away and I pull hard on it, if I don't have a chin strap, there's a chance I could pull this ring into his mouth. And some horses panic tremendously when that ring goes into their mouth. So the purpose of the chin strap on a snaffle bit is to prevent the rider from pulling the ring into their mouth. So he's now bridled. All I need to do is take the halter off. Notice none of our equipment is on the ground where either he or I could step on it and cause a mouth injury. When we unbridle the horse, we go through the same process as we did when bridling. We put the halter around his neck near his pole for control. Shank goes over the left arm. Nothing is wrapped around the arm. Reins are over the right arm. Nothing is wrapped around the arm. Again, if we're not sure and if this horse has any sensitivity in his mouth and you think he might fling his head, turn his head a little bit towards you. Then if he does take his head, he's probably going to move it away from you. Now, this is the handler's job not to bang the horse in the teeth. So when I take this crown piece off, I'm not going to drop it. Watch the horse's tongue. And he will use his tongue to guide that bit out of his mouth and make sure that it doesn't bang his teeth. If you have an older horse, you may be riding it with a shank bit. All right, this is a leverage bit. So we have to look at a few more things. One is the curb chain or curb strap, it now serves a purpose. This is a chain. If you're going to use a chain on your bridle, it must be flat. It shouldn't be twisted, or that makes where it's twisted stick into his nerves underneath his jaw. So it should be flat if that's what you choose to use. All right, notice where the curb strap is attached to the bit. I see a lot of people attach it down here. This is not what this ring is for. This ring supposedly is to attach a rein and you're supposed to be able to ride this bit as though it were a snaffle. It doesn't quite work that way, so I don't advise it, but that's the intention. So we don't use that for your curb strap. The curb strap is attached to the same ring as your cheek pieces for it to work properly. So let's put this on him. This is a two-year-old horse, so I certainly am not riding him with this bit, but I will put it on so I can show you. So again, very quiet, very relaxed. He's sleeping a little, so I'll just pick his head up a bit. Again, be careful of his teeth, not to irritate him. When he gets the bit into his mouth, be careful of his ears. And make sure that your brow band is sitting square. So once we have our throat latch correctly adjusted, then we need to look here. You notice I've already undid this because I suspected that the bit is not in the right place in his mouth. So if you look down here, you can see the bit is quite low in his mouth. So I'm going to pick it up one hole or two holes just so it's up so he's not having to chew on it at all. Now, we need to go like this in front of him to make sure that it's even on both sides. If it isn't appropriate, then I'll go to the other side and do up the buckle on the other side. Now, this is crucial. Where should this chain be adjusted to so it works correctly on the horse? For those of you who are older, what the general rule is the bit is now sitting relaxed in his mouth. If I move the bottom of the shank here no more than 30 degrees, 
that's where it should take contact. So I moved it about there. So if I'm thinking here to here is 90, boop, boop, then about a third of that would be 30. So I moved it that far and it's taking contact. You can use the two finger rule, but on some horses, depending on the conformation or shape of their jaw, that does not work. It does work on this particular gelding. Okay, so again, please take note, the chin strap or curb chain does up to the same ring as the cheek piece on the head stall. We've all met horses that don't want to have the bridle on. In that case, we are going to use the second method of bridling. That just helps us to stay safe and gives us a better chance of being successful in getting it on. So this method is called the hug method. So we start basically the same way as we started with the other bridle. We just get their head in there. But my right hand then goes around his muzzle and obviously if he didn't want the bridle on, he'd have his head a lot higher. And we take a hold of it very short on the cheek pieces, so our hand is actually resting on the bridge of his nose. If he's being really obstinate, we can actually move his head towards us. And then if he does decide to fling his head, the chances of him hitting us are not as great because he will probably move his head away from us. We then position the bit, so it's going to be ready. Use our thumb or our fingers to open the horse's mouth. When he opens it, we elevate, then we change hands. Take it here and move his ears into position. So it's not that much different than the first method. The advantage of it is because you are in that hug method position, you can better control the lower part of his head. It's important just to try to stabilize it and not to try to force it. As soon as you try to force it, the horse is going to fling his head and there's a chance he could hit you. Same thing. Horses that are difficult to bridle are often just as difficult to unbridle. So for our safety and protection, after we get the ears out of the head stall, we often bring their head towards us and keep our hand on the bridge of their nose. So if they do, do go to fling their head, we can prevent them from hitting us by pushing our body away from them. The unsaddling procedure is the exact opposite of saddling. First thing we're going to do is put the stirrup up on the horn again so it's out of the way. Take the latigo out of the keeper, undo the buckle, then undo it. Now, this is where we need to look after our equipment a little bit more. If we drag this out to our truck and it gets all full of burrs and other debris, then that could potentially irritate the horse next time I saddle him. So it needs to be hooked up somehow. The method that you choose to hook it up doesn't matter. As long as it is hooked up, that's all that matters. So make sure it's done up in a way that's not going to be a problem. Again, watch his ear and eye reaction. All right, and come around here. Once I'm around here, again, this is just totally looking after my equipment. My cinch has a keeper, and the keeper is to do it up in. You can just bend your cinch like that and do it up like this, or some people prefer to actually undo it here so that it hangs straight. Either way is acceptable. Once I've got that done, again, noting his reaction to me moving around him, I go back to this side and take the stirrup down. Now, if I really thought I was going to have trouble, Getting this saddle off, I could put that stirrup up on the horn. Before I pull the saddle off, especially if I've ridden him quite long and quite hard, he's going to be sticky and wet under here. So I want to make sure I unlock the saddle off of his withers here. So my hand goes up under the blanket. I lift it up a little bit before I bring it over. This arm goes completely down the gullet and I grab the saddle pad by the back of it so that everything comes off at once. I don't leave the blanket on because it could potentially fall off if the wind was blowing. If I have nowhere to put it on a stand, then it is acceptable to place it on the ground like that so it's sitting on its gullet 
and I would put my blanket over it with the wet side up. If I close my blanket up and it's damp, the next time I come to use it, it will be all mildewy. So we want to make sure the wet side is up when we store our saddle blanket. When we are ready to saddle the horse with the English saddle, it is common to take both the numna or the saddle pad and the saddle at the same time. The reason for this is, especially if you're saddling outside, because this is so light, it can easily blow off before you have a chance to get the saddle on. So we take them both together. We approach the horse in the usual way, make sure he's calm and relaxed and receptive to the equipment we're going to put on him. Put the pad on his back, place it, make sure it's as wrinkle free as possible and place the saddle on top. When we get the saddle on top, we check to see that there is an equal amount of fringe showing on the white, both in front and behind the saddle. So we wiggle and jiggle and do whatever necessary to get it placed where we want it to be placed. Make sure there's a little bit of an air pocket there so it's not going to bind on him. Once we're happy with everything on the left side, we come around to the right and we again check. Is there an equal amount of fringe all the way around the saddle? Make sure nothing is stuck underneath, nothing is where it should not be. Once we're happy with that, we take the girth out of the stirrups and we're ready to attach it to the saddle. When we do that, when we lift this up, we can see three straps. Those are called billets. We generally do up the back billet first. After we have it done up, then this little strap is what holds the saddle blanket or the numb nut in place. It must be somehow attached and there are a number of ways that the numb nut can be attached. Some of them just have Velcro that goes straight across and some do up like this one. We hook it on the billet and then we do it up to the girth. Once that is done and we're happy again that the saddle is placed where we want it placed on the horse, we go back to this side. Once we're back here, we're ready to start. First thing we're going to do is hook up our numna to the billet. So just like on the other side, make sure it's ready to go before we pick up the girth. Reach under carefully, get the girth, and now you're ready to do it up. Okay, at this time, we are not doing the girth up tight. We're just doing it tight enough so that if he should move or shake, it's not going to fall off. Once we've stretched out his legs and have the bridle on him, we will move him a little bit and tighten it slightly before we get on. So it's a continual process. It's not just do it up snugly right in the beginning. When we go to bridle with an English bridle, there's a few other things you have to consider. First of all, every English bridle has a nose band or cavison, so it's important that that be adjusted correctly. An English snaffle bit does not have a chin strap. The reason for that is if your cavison or nose band is adjusted correctly, the horse cannot open his mouth wide enough to get the offside into his mouth. Notice this particular bit has full cheeks. That is one type of English bit. Another type of English snaffle would be just a ring snaffle, very similar to the Western one that we put on earlier. Technique is exactly the same. Halter on the right arm or anything attached to it and the bridle on the left arm. The technique for putting the bridle on is very similar to the Western one. You just have to be careful that the cavison does not get in the way. So again, right hand is going to control Lifting the bit, lower hand opens the horse's mouth. Once the bit is in his mouth, right hand puts it over his ears and helps adjust. Again, we adjust the brow band so it's going to be evenly spaced below his ears and we do up our throat latch. It's a boy. Once we've got that throat latch done up, and again, we do it up for exactly the same spacing as the Western one. And we make sure that we use all these keepers 
that are provided on the English headstall. When we go to do up this cavison, we have to make sure that it is in the right spot. So the correct spot for that cavison, again, is below those cheekbones. One or two fingers. So that's just nice and balanced on his head. Once you've got that done, you're gonna do it up tight enough so that if he were to be pulling on the bit and I pulled sideways that he can't open his mouth wide enough that the ring could possibly go in, but loose enough so that he's still comfortable enough to lick his lips and swallow. Lunging is a good skill for 4-H members to learn, let alone the horse. Why do we lunge the horse? First of all, if it's a day like this where the wind is blowing, many horses are quite high, so this will take the edge off them. Second reason, basic obedience, teach that horse to listen to you and watch your body position and react accordingly. Thirdly, we can teach this horse to drive up, which is something that we want. Once we get to rider three and beyond, we can teach him to give his head a little bit to the inside. So there's all kinds of skills we can teach the horse on the lunge line. Basically, when we're lunging, we can lunge off of the halter. As you see here, I've attached the snap to the cheek ring, not the bottom ring. In the initial stages of lunging, because I want that horse to be looking slightly to the inside of the circle. If I lunge him and he lunges all the time with his head to the outside and he drops his shoulder to the inside, then all I'm doing is reinforcing a bad habit of the horse. So that's step one. My recommendation for safety in holding the lunge line is that you hold it in two hands. The reason for that is if you should slip and let go with one, you will still have a hold of the line with another hand. It can be quite dangerous if a horse gets loose dragging 30 feet of lunge line behind him. The lunge whip is not used as a weapon, but is used as an extension of your arm as a tool to cause the horse to go forward or help get that forward impulsion. You can use it in an aggressive fashion where it's pointing this way, or if your horse is a little more sensitive, you can reverse it and just carry it behind you. If you tell me that your horse is scared of whips, then you haven't done your homework, and that's part of it, is conditioned your horse to have a rope or anything that's got a tail on it like this move around him. How do we hold that line? If we're talking about young 4-H'ers or even older ones, probably the safest method is the English method, which is a figure eight. Western ones do use the loop like Lariat, and it can be safely used too. But if we're talking about maximum safety, this one probably fills the bill. What am I gonna do in the first instance? For sure, I'm not gonna chase him out to the end of the lunge line and then hope that I can control him. I never wanna get in the situation where he's pulling and I've got my heels dug in and he's trying to drag me around the arena. So I'm gonna start out with a quite small circle. Next thing that I have to remember is to check the safety aspects. No spurs on me, gloves in case he should pull, and splint boots on the horse. You can do his back legs as well if you so choose. What are the three positions for lunging? If he does not want to go forward, we stay in the chase position, which is close to the hip. If he's going forward appropriately, we stay opposite the stirrup. And if we want him to slow down or stop, we step in front of his eye. So basic herd instincts. If I'm the aggressive horse in the herd and I want this horse to move, I'm gonna bite him on the bum. So I'm gonna be in a position where I can bite him on the bum to chase him forward. If I wanna cut this horse off so he can't get to the feed pile that I want, I'm gonna step in front of his eye and threaten him. My threat is not going to be anything other than to run him into the fence if he doesn't stop or turn. So I don't mean that he's physically gonna run hard into the fence, but I'm going to challenge him and give him the choice, either stop and turn or try to get past me. Most of the time, the horses will stop and turn. Okay, now we're ready to get started. So, step one, I make sure that I've checked my pan. So we're starting in a round pan because this just gives you an added safety feature of a fence being around you. 
No major rocks in it, no slippery spots, nothing that's going to give him any grief. The fence is safe, so we're ready to start. I'm going to move back into that chase position. We're going to assume that this horse does not know how to lunge, okay? And I'm going to stay about this far away. Now, someone's going to say he could kick you from there. Yes, he can kick me if I let his head go to the outside. But if I always keep that little bit of contact on his face, then his hips are going to go to the outside. So before I even go, you notice I checked him there to make sure he's going to give me his face a little bit. So I want to play with that and make sure that he's going to bring his head towards me if I put some contact on it, which he did. Going to go back here for a minute now. The reason that I don't hook this snap onto this bottom ring right away is if I do have to pull on him, then he often will bring his nose or his muzzle towards me, but his ears will actually be going the other way. So we get that twist in the head, and in that case, the horse often leans to the outside. So I wanted to bring his head squarely around towards me. Okay, I'm back in the chase position, get him looking at me, and now I'm gonna ask him to go forward. So we're gonna have probably two types of horses. Either the horse that wants to go like a bat, or horse like this that's somewhat lazy. So I'm just gonna keep looking at his hip, stay in that chase position, so I'm closer to his back end than his front end. Notice I'm walking right now. The reason that I'm walking is that I want to encourage him to go forward. I just want him to go nice and easy forward. I'm not in any panic about him going fast at this time. Okay, so I was ready for him that time. I knew he was gonna stop for the weed and I just give him a little help. Notice my whip is not going up in the air. I don't want it up high above his back. I can just rotate it up behind him and as he's going around this circle, notice his head is angled slightly to the inside. When we get that done, I'm ready to stop him. So when he's going forward and I want to stop, I have to change my position. I have to get in front of his eye. So as we come around here, all I'm going to